Hello, everybody. My name's Chrissy Fiebig. Um, I don't know if we want to, Karina, you want to go, and Jerry, you want to say your name, just so everyone hears? Of course. Hi, I'm Karina Vega. I'm the compost intern. I'm super excited. This is my first, basically, semester ever being a compost intern, so super excited. Awesome team, and here to educate. I'm Jerry Swider. I'm the compost operator. So me and Chrissy go around collecting all the compost from on campus. Yep. So I would first like to acknowledge that we are on Weot land at Humboldt State University, and this is tribal land. So if you don't know what type of land you're on, I suggest you go look it up and see whose land you're on and just educate yourself and how they're incorporating their practices today, if at all possible. So without a further to do, welcoming, welcome to the Compost 101 webinar, Fall 2020, COVID-19 style. Jerry, you want to kick us off? <laughs> sure. Welcome to our composting workshop. We're going to cover a variety of different kinds of composting, as well as how you can get started composting at your house or your apartment and what you can do if you don't have the resources to create your own composting methods. So as you can see, there are many different kinds of composting. Um, you can kind of pick your choice depending on what uh, fits your personality or what kind of space you have available, what, um, what types of things you'll be composting. So the first kind in the top left is open air, which is probably one of the more common types. Um, it's when people just make a pile in their backyard, um, you know, toss fall leaves on there and then just layer it with uh, different kinds of food compost when they when they get kitchen scraps. And that can be hot or cold depending on the amount of compost you're using. So if you have a big old pile, it's going to tend to be a lot hotter. And if you have a smaller pile, a smaller operation, then it's going to be more uh, cold composting. And then another kind which is really accessible is direct composting, which is when you just stick, uh, stick your compost in the ground. You take your food, your paper, and you dig a hole and stick it in the ground and then cover it back up. And about a month later, if you dig in that same spot again, the food is going to be decomposed. It's going to be a lot more rich soil. All those nutrients from the food are going to be recycled back into the earth. And that's really accessible because people can just do it in their backyard, um, around the neighborhood, wherever you have um, ground that you're able to dig into. And then another kind is bokashi, which I personally don't have much experience with, but it's, um, it's great for apartment composting because you can do it inside and you basically just buy these pre-made packages of microorganisms essentially, and you seal it up in a bucket and it ferments the organic matter. And then after it's been all fermented, you kind of similar to the direct composting, you can just stick it in the ground and it's all primed and ready to go for the microorganisms to digest and turn into new nutrients. And then another method is the compot, which is uh, basically just a little pot, kind of similar to the direct, you stick it into the ground, but it has holes in the side so that the uh, materials can seep from the pot outward into the soil. Um, and similarly to the direct composting, it's nice because you can just do it and forget about it. And next time you go back, it'll all be decomposed. And then another method is the tumbler method, which is this little guy right here. And these are really nice because you can, um, you spin them, which helps aerate the microorganisms and increases the rate of decomposition. And um, you can use them inside because they have a little flap that closes and helps cut off the smell from um, escaping into the rest of your house. Um, but more typically, they're outside um, because when you do open them up, it's going to you know, release the, the odor of decomposing stuff. And then my personal favorite is the vermicomposting, which is using worms to decompose all your food. And this is great because you can do it pretty much anywhere. You can build the bin yourself. You can pretty much do it all from scrap. So it's really accessible, really cheap to make, 
and you don't really have to maintain it much. You just have to feed them every week or so. Um, the next method is commercial, which is a good option if you don't really have the space or the resources to create any of your own composting methods. So there are some services which will pick up uh, your, your food scraps from like the driveway pretty much similar to trash service, but for compost. And then they'll um, do the composting for you on a commercial scale. Um, but this one and the mechanical are kind of less preferable because you are uh, using greenhouse gases. Um, you know, there's trucks that are coming to pick up your compost. You could avoid all of that by just doing it on site. So it is a little bit more impact than if you do it yourself, but it's better than not doing anything at all. And the last method is mechanical, which I also have not very much experience with, but it's good because you can use it inside. Um, it's this little machine that essentially heats the food scraps up to the temperature where they're gonna decompose that really quickly. So you can just stick the food in there, it kind of processes it and um, decomposes it really fast. And then it doesn't do the full decomp decomposition process, but after about 24 hours, it's ready to stick in the ground, either in the direct method or the compot method. And I just wanted to add this slide because I think it's important that people understand composting is not the answer to your waste. It's kind of a last ditch effort to keep food from going into the landfill. And the really the more important method in reducing your waste is not buying as much because if you're buying a bunch of food and then half of it gets wasted, you could cut your waste in half just by buying half as much food instead of composting the, you know, the other half that you didn't end up eating. So the most important um, factor is source reduction, um, buying from sustainable sources. And then after that, composting and recycling is a good way to reduce your excess waste. But you really should be trying to reduce your waste from the top down because um, it kind of has a multiplying effect where um, if you buy less, you use less resources to get that food to where you're buying it from, and then you don't have to dispose of it either. So it, it kind of works on many different levels. And now, if you give me a second, I'm going to switch over to a different screen and give you guys a look at my worm bin. So here you can see my worm bin in the backyard. I created this in the spring semester um, when I was in the education branch. And at the start, it was a lot lighter than it is now, but now it's getting kind of hefty. Um, and you can see there's lots of little decomposing things in here, bits of eggshell carton, which are a carbon source. And it's got these two layers of bins because composting has a tendency to generate a lot of moisture. So I'm not sure if you can see, but there's a lot of liquid sloshing around in here, which actually makes for great nutrients if you um, pour it on your plants, which I haven't gotten around to doing yet because it's been kind of collecting for a little bit. But the way I created this bin is I pretty much just bought these two bins um, and then I drilled a bunch of holes around the top part to help um, increase the airflow. And then I also, I can't really point it out, but there's holes on the bottom of the bin to let the liquid drain through into the bottom layer. And then on the, the lid, there's a bunch more holes so that there's really good airflow in here, which um, is key for worms because they're living organisms and they need air just like us. And if there's not enough air, um, the composting turns anaerobic, which is really bad for the worms and can result in a lot of them dying off all at once. Um, and after I'm done with this, I will post a link in the chat about how I built this and a few other um, composting resources for how you can get started doing something similar at home. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to show you how I add food here and you can see I have a bunch of these little bins. I didn't actually buy any of these. These are just from <clears throat> either from like a hummus container or 
I use a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of yogurt containers. I just keep them and reuse them for gathering food waste. And um, also takeout containers are great for that. So you don't really need to buy anything new. You just have to reuse what you have. And <clears throat> the way that I feed my worms is I'll just sprinkle a layer of all the food scraps I have. <clears throat> Probably about 50% of my food scraps is just avocado skin. And then once I have it all spread out on the top here, try to get it kind of even. <clears throat> Jerry, just an FYI, your screen kind of went out. Don't know why. Oh no. <laughs> Let me see if I can fix that. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Alrighty. So. Okay. Not sure what happened there. So one of the key factors <clears throat> for any form of composting is making sure you've got the right ratio of carbon to nitrogen. So all these food scraps are nitrogen sources. They're going to decompose and release a lot of nitrogen. So you have to even that out by adding a lot of carbon. And these are just um, ripped up paper bags. I use uh, my old eggshell containers. <clears throat> and the ratio is about two to one or three to one or one to one, depending on who you ask. But the important part is kind of just figuring out how your bin um, reacts to different kinds of food. So I know that when I add the avocado skins, <clears throat> they take a long time to decompose. So I tend to add a little bit more carbon sources. And another form of carbon is um, if you've got leaves in your backyard that fall in the fall and get all over your property, you can just rake those up and save them year round. Those are a great source of carbon. Or if you're mowing your lawn and you've got lots of lawn trimmings, that's another great source of carbon. Um, <clears throat> but if you don't have the right balance going on in your bin, then it'll throw the little, um, it'll throw their equilibrium out of whack and it can kind of just mess with the worm population. So once I've got it all covered up here, um, I pretty much just put it away and I'm done. Um, I leave it in, inside so that they don't feel the temperature change between night and day as much. And um, <clears throat> you only really have to feed them once a week or once every two weeks, depending on how fast they're eating the food. And worms are great because they will kind of self-sustain their own population. So if there's lots of food, the worms will reproduce and um, make lots of little baby worms. And if there's not as much food, then a few of them will die off and they'll kind of stabilize at whatever the equilibrium is for the amount of food that you're providing them. So they're really self-sustaining. There's not much you have to do to make sure they stay alive um, as long as you're feeding them the compost. And I haven't gotten around to harvesting this yet but from my understanding, the way that you would harvest the finished compost at the end of this is either going through, um, not feeding them for maybe about a month so that they kind of eat everything, and then going through and separating the worms from the soil, either by using like a metal strainer type thing, or you can kind of just push everything to one side and only feed them on one side for a month or two. And that way, all the worms are concentrated in one spot. And then the other side will be kind of all the finished compost that they've already eaten. And uh, if you have any questions about worm composting, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. I can get to those once the other parts of the presentation are over. Um, but yeah, Karina, would you like to move on to apartment composting? Uh, sorry, the computer is a little slow, but let me get that. Well, thank you for Jerry for that explanation on vermicomposting. The compost tea is the liquid that is 
usually what it's called. So if you're looking it up online, compost tea is what it's called. So just like pasta water after you're done making pasta, compost tea is just a little extra additive nutrients just to keep in mind. Alrighty, Karina has this lovely presentation about apartment, apartment composting for all of your guys' enjoyment. And in the chat, Jerry put a link into the local worm guy, which is our current in Arcata, the commercial composting. It's basically a one man job that helps us all. All right, Karina, have at it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jerry. You're actually going to lead right into my, <laughs> my own presentation here. Uh, basically, worm composting is probably the best option for apartment composting, but we do have uh, three listed here. We have the, of course, the worm bin, the on the spot composting with uh, brown paper bags, like you just bury it in your garden. And what I use, which is a compost tumbler. There. And of course, with the worm bin, you just have to make sure the little guys are safe and just within that range of temperature. Um, it's just 30 minutes of like maintaining the bin a week, which is really low, uh, maintaining them basically. And there's no turning required compared to a compost tumbler. The worms just kind of do most of the work for you. And it usually homemade doesn't go, the cost does not go past $30. So it's a really, really good way to start. And probably my favorite, but I already got a compost tumbler. <laughs> And for the worm bin, I did have this here also. It's similar to Jerry's, but it's supported by, in this example, two bricks. You can also use um, like the little sour cream um, leftover um, containers to elevate it. The tray down here would collect the, the moistness coming down from the worm bin and just make, making sure that it's ventilated and making sure the worms are happy and content in their little environment. And with on the spot composting, we have an arrangement with CCAT. So if you're off campus and not getting your um, compost taken in by the compost squad, and you wanna bring your compost in from outside, you can just bring it into CCAT. You can just put your compost, uh, like your nitrogen and your brown and a little brown paper bag and bring it in. You just have to follow the signs and also, of course, follow the um, COVID regulations, you know, wear a mask, social distance, but it's really nice. And then if you can't reach the site, you can always uh, call the worm guy and have a street pickup as well. Or you can also take your brown paper bag with all your veggie scraps and your of course, your carbon and dig a hole in your garden large enough to drop the bag and just drop it right in. And here we go into what I use, which is a compost tumbler. I'm trying to upgrade for Christmas. That's my Christmas present. And they can be on the high side, depending on which one you want to use. Um, I love cranking it. You just have to be careful because if it gets too full, it's harder to crank. So. But at the same time, you can get some really buff composting arms. <laughs> so it's, it's really fun to actually just crank the compost tumbler around. It's fully sealed. Um, it heats up. So just depending on the, on the color of the compost tumbler, it'll attract more heat and the heat aids in the composting process and speed. And of course, there's some that with the compartment, they don't smell, so you can bring them in but just make sure to take them out when the composting gathering time comes in. And you can actually do, um, I tried it with my community, but we switch managers quite often. But if you live in uh, an apartment community, you can start your own composting thing. Everyone can buy a compost tumbler together and start the composting process there as well because I do have quite a few neighbors that have their own patios and own little mini gardens. So it's just a really nice community gathering activity and also just good all around for Mother Earth. And then just 
the compost ratio, it just varies on the one that you buy and it varies like 10 to 20, uh, 10 to one or 20 to one, just on like the carbon nitrogen ratio, but it's just the basics of maintaining the 75% carbon and the 25% of the greens going in. So you can use your long clippings um, or since mine is on a balcony, so we have literally a tree over. We don't really have a garden. I take all my compost to my boyfriend's house and his grandma. So I feed the little lime tree that we have because <laughs> I love limes. <laughs> so we use, I use it for that. So even though if I, I personally don't have a garden myself, I just compost for others. So it's just an all overround uh, really good, but it can be big. So if you're trying to bring it in and you live in a colder area, I live in Southern California, so it's perfectly fine outside. It doesn't get too cold here. But if it gets too cold, you would have to bring it in and you'd have to have that space. And here, what did we learn? So worm bin composting is the best just in price maintenance and the size. As you saw with Jerry, it's pretty small. Compost bins can be pretty dang big, <laughs> depending on the one that you buy. And just think about the size, uh, the lifestyle and your preference on maintaining it and just have fun and make sure to give back to the soil. And here are my references. And if you have any uh, questions on some compost tumblers, let me know. I have <laughs> I've reviewed quite a few because I want to get a new one. So just let me know in the chat after all the presentations. Perfect. Thank you, Karina. So that was the presentation on apartment compost. Perfect. I will be going over what we do at Humboldt State University. So in regards to going back a little bit to apartment composting, I know some people have pets and they like to get into the compost itself in, in the bin so they could like eat up all the food scraps. I suggest possibly getting an own, your own bin. So what we use are these 10 gallon buckets of compost. So this is finished compost. There we go. So this is what finished compost looks like. We actually give out finished compost at the Rose House in the Toter. So if you need reused office supplies, it's at the Rose House. These buckets also come with a lid, so they snap on. You can also buy ones that twist on. So like your dog, your cat, I don't know if people have birds or lizards or whatever animal you have, they most likely won't be able to get into them, but that is something that you might want to invest in. They're like $10 roughly each. So if it is a concern for you, that's definitely one you want to use. So we have stickers on here and it says what you can and cannot put into the compost. And it's beautiful. So we go around, we, per we have a Rad Bureau e-bike, which we have been using this year, which is really exciting. Uh, <laughs> and it's an electric bicycle. It's a couple years process in the making. So it's finally here and it's finally ready. It can fit about 11 buckets inside the back of the cart if you want to call it a cart and what what we do is we go around campus we switch it out we've been in association with housing so part of the canyon we are supplying to along with sunset uh for on campus composting if you live on campus and you want a little compost bin you can contact the rsa and a Versetti, Versetti, I don't want to butcher her last name, but her name's Anna. And you can request one of these little buckets. And then there are compost, uh, what looks like a trash can, but they're next to a trash can in a recycling bin. And you, you can just dump it in there. And they're uh, dishwasher safe, so that's really useful, or you can just clean it out by hand. So we 
Do you share screen? Wait, hold up. I'm not really sure. Share screen. Okay, it's not letting me share screen. This is fun. Uh, here we go. Sorry about that. So this is what. Oh no. <laughs> there we go. So this is our compost corner. It's in front of the Rose House. You'll find the toter located right here. I want to make sure I'm still screen sharing. Cool. Okay. Didn't, didn't show it. Cool. Still screen sharing. Awesome. So our compost corner students at HSU and anyone who knows about this that is in the arcade area can come by and pick up free compost to have amendments for your garden or just your soils and everything you want. This is our little earth tub. So what we do is we have a big, big tub. Think of it like a big tub. Uh, we have a big tub and what it does is it has a rotator in it and it's an electric drill and we turn it two times counterclockwise, two times clockwise and it helps with the aerobotic amendments and soils. So we also have a biofilter which helps with the aerobotic microbials in there which really helps just decomposing the compost. And so I have these couple videos. It's they're about uh, bucket cleaning and earth tub spinning. So uh, okay. And so here's little videos to check out.
Alrighty, alrighty. So that was the bucket cleaning. And what we do is we make sure to give out clean buckets to the people who ask for buckets around campus. And that was just the whole ordeal. Uh, if that was a little long, I apologize. Uh, what we do is we also add carbon to the buckets. So as an example, I brought this little bucket. I currently live on campus, so I have one of these little guys. We open it and we collect sawdust from one of the local saw mills which uses like organic redwoods and other natural trees around here so as you can see we have the sawdust and then we use this as the carbon and we just sprinkle it in to be like a base and then you have your carbon carbon for your compost and that's how we do it and then we give out these buckets the people who want them, but not these particular buckets. We give out the 10 gallon buckets, but that's for on campus composting. So one of the challenges we have faced throughout this school year is that not that many people have been requesting buckets just due to the low amount of people who are currently on campus. We used to supply about 48 buckets and use roughly the mall and we would have a lot of people asking for buckets and now we only have roughly six people asking for buckets but some of those places like housing only ask they ask for multiple buckets so that's where we're getting most of our compost from in regards to our maintenance we do on currently on thursdays we have our maintenance day where we take the metrics. So here's our metric book. And we write, we jot down the day who, who was there, the temperature, currently we're writing down the e-bike miles. We also do, if we did any maintenance, we turned it and the temperature. In the past, the average temperature was about 115 degrees, and that's how most composts should be. But due to the low amount of compost we are receiving and the amount that it can contain, it can our current earth tub can intake about 100 pounds of compost per day. But right now, we're only doing about 40, 40 pounds a week, which is slightly sad. So. I have another little video to show you. It's about Earth Tub Maintenance Day, and I hope you guys enjoy it.
So that was our operations. This is our current Earth Tub log. So prior to the beginning of the fall 2020 semester, we didn't have the e-bike miles on here, but now we do. So we can definitely take all of the metrics we need in order to stay up to date on everything we have to do. So this is our current input of how many pounds we've had for the year 2020 because of COVID uh, it really messed up our March and April as well as May input system just due to not being on campus and not being allowed to pick up buckets. But since September, in the September we only got 16 pounds just due to uh, regulations of being allowed to work on campus. So this month of October, we have been able to get a lot of compost, which is amazing. And I'm very, very happy about that because that means more compost for everybody else. So this is in comparison to uh, the year 2019. So this is, I would say, is about the usual amount we would receive prior to COVID. We we received over 3,000 pounds of food waste, which was absolutely amazing because that's not going into landfill, that's being on campus composting, which is great. So we divided that much food last year, and just so you guys can like compare the two again. So this is 2020, this is 2019. So earlier this semester, Jerry and I were able to harvest our compost. And now we have that harvested toter of compost by the Rose House. So if you guys want to come pick some up, you're more than welcome to. This is the operations we have going on. We usually put uh, two wheelbarrows just around it, one to collect the finished compost and the other to collect the unfinished compost, which we put in a pile and put back into the earth tub. So what you see is the uh, filter. So basically it's an electric and it moves in a circular form and it drops all of the finished compost down below. There's other ways that you can filter out compost if you want. Uh, back home in my compost bin, I usually just find a, a metal mesh tray that was used for some other equipment, <laughs> but that works too. So whatever thing you want to just filter through really helps really get that fine compost. So here's another photo of Jerry scooping in the compost. Here's Jerry and I <laughs> posing with our compost. So we currently moved the shed because we have plans to build a compost bucket shed to keep them all safe during the rainy weather once we get the rainy weather. We, this is at housing, uh, one of, it was taken by Dakota Cox and he is a current lumberjack journalist. So he did an article on the Zero Waste Conference and got some photos of us on our run. So, and that's the little cart for the Rad Bureau bike. 
So these are the locations on campus of the residence hall that we are supplying to. We're supplying to Sunset, Cedar, Alder, Jinquapin, Madrone, Tanoak, and Pepperwood because Hemlock and Maple are not currently in use, neither is Redwood. So this is just another photo. We got a little thank you note from Leslie in the SBS, which was really, really nice and we really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, just a little photo of the bike. Here's a full on photo of the Rad Bureau bike because this thing is cool. I personally really like the orange color and it's been really nifty. We used to use electric vehicles prior to getting this bike, but this bike is definitely a lot more reliable than the, the electric vehicles. So if you do want to teach little kids how to do compost, you can do this little recipe. It's basically mimicking a compost recipe with pudding. So with the green sprinkles or mint leaves you could use and then that uh, symbolizes, you know, the f uh, part of the carbon ratio, which would be like grass clippings or something. And then the Oreos are also browns. Uh, you could, Oreos as another form of carbon. And then the pudding would be the actual compost itself. And then you would mix it and it would show all of the ingredients and then you would do gummy worms for the worms. Yes, so. That is my little spiel. I'll also show you guys our, this is what we use to take temperature for our warm bin. It's a specially made backyard compost temperature core. So you can see it has all the little bits and you can see it's long. So it's specifically made for composting just due to the length of it. I, my head's like 5'3", so you can imagine how long my arm is. Um, so that's, it's long, so it can really get the full length of the compost compared to other uh, just thermometers that take it. And also, it's just, it's kind of cute. We kept the box because, you know, safe, safe travels. On the back, it says what you can and can't put into your compost bin. Our personal facilities, we do not accept meat or cheese. So that's something you might want to keep in mind uh, if you're doing like home composting. But I know commercial composting does accept meat and cheese. And they also accept some of those commercially quote unquote biodegradable plastics. We personally do not accept those because our facility does not allow it just due to the logistics of how we're basically like backyard compost on a little larger scale. We also weigh the buckets. So we have a tear, this is our scale and we can tear it. So we have a little on off tear switch so you guys can see. So you can imagine how we do all of our processes. So that is my little spiel. We have a couple questions in the comments. And they say, they, so I don't know if they want me to say their name or not, but I'll just ask the question. Someone asked, do you have to initially buy the worms and does keeping the compost in the bin cause order? I don't know if Jerry, you wanna answer that part, but in regards to the odor, composting does get a little smelly. So that's something you might wanna consider if you're a little hectic, but you definitely get used to the smell and it's nothing bad. <laughs> Yeah, so as far as the worms, um, I bought mine from the local worm guy, which is where HSU sends all of their excess food scraps to. Um, it's one of those commercial composting facilities. And he sells them for um, it's a thousand worms, which is about a pound for about $35. But it's kind of an initial investment because you won't really ever have to buy the worms again. And you can even, if you have extra worms, you can. Um, Pick them up and give them to your friends so that they don't need to buy worms. Um, and yeah, as far as the odor, I keep mine in a little shed in the back, so it's not really in the house where the odor would um, have an impact. But like Chrissy mentioned, it's a little bit smelly, but after a little bit, you get used to it. 
And to answer your second question, Cassie, um, generally you can compost pretty much any food scraps, but there are some stuff you want to avoid like citrus peels, um, like orange lemon peels are a little bit iffy. Onion peels are okay in small amounts, but you don't want to do too many onion peels. Um, I think there's a few other things, but I'm going to drop a link to a graphic that shows all the do's and do nots into the chat. And then in regards to eggshells, I feel like that might be a question someone might have like lingering on their mind. It depends how many eggshells you want to put in your compost, depending on your location. So here in NorCal, when it's all wet and rainy, eggshells provide a form of sand, almost. If you think, think of them like sand. So they're very dry. They help dry out your compost to keep it. Sometimes it gets too moist up here, so adding eggshells helps. But down in SoCal, it's ideally don't add that many eggshells because it just won't go it won't create a good micro um, organism happiness. Yeah. Yeah, eggshells are a source of carbon, yeah, so they're good in carbon. small amounts, but if you have too many, they can take a long time to decompose. And yeah, they're really gritty, so that it takes a while for the worms to work through them. Thank you for, for, for that, Jerry. Appreciate that. So from India, she they asked, uh, for worm composting, since you only feed them every week or two, how much of your food waste are you able to compost this way? Do, your compost, do you compost your other food scraps alternatively? Um, so I, that worm bin is able to compost pretty much all of my food scraps. Uh, I eat a lot of fresh foods, so. It does, it is a little bit small. Um, I have five other roommates and it would not be able to fit all of their compost. But um, yeah, the worm bin size that I chose is a little bit on the smaller side and more of a personal scale. Um, but I haven't had the need to compost any food scraps in any other ways. Um, and another thing that that just reminded me of is it'll help your decomposition process to go quicker if you chop all your food scraps up into like small pieces and or you can put them in the freezer which makes the, the cells um, it bursts the cell wall and helps it decompose faster before you put it in the worm bin um, you don't want to put it in frozen but if you just freeze your food scraps and then set them to the side then they'll decompose quicker and it'll also kind of shrink them down a little bit so that you can fit more into your little containers and our next question says uh, from Michelle Mil Miller, they asked, do the little stickers the grocery store puts on the fruits decompose or do you need to remove them? We actually have to remove them. They do not decompose, sadly. So if you're bothered by these little stickers, I suggest going to your local farmer's market. Farmer's market, especially here in Arcata, we are very, very blessed to have such a lovely farmer's market in our square. So I highly suggest just you know, helping out local farmers, getting some local fresh fruit, veggies. Uh, I know some places there's one guy that sells honey. Uh, definitely farmers markets are the way to shop. Uh, with bulk items currently due to the whole pandemic, most places are not allowing you to bring your bulk items, which is very, very sad. But if you are currently located in Arcata and you're a tea fanatic just like myself, there is this place called Moonrise Herbs that I have been able to bring. I bring a clean jar because they won't accept your jar if it's clean. They'll sanitize the outside and then they'll just dump the tea into your, your jar. And then you're like, you're good to go and you have zero waste tea and you can use a reusable tea steeper. Uh, just, I just wanted to put that out there. But to answer your question, no. They do not decompose. And when we do, we we find most of the little stickers when we're doing the harvest. So that's all fun. 
The next question, Cassie, when you're talking about ratios, what do you mean by that nitrogen and carbon? So nitrogen and carbon, we refer to the carbon as uh, like grass, the little wood shavings, and nitrogen would be the actual compost, your actual food scraps. So the two work together symbiotically in order to produce a healthy sustaining compost and that attracts worms and other little buggies to help to really maintain a healthy little ecosystem of sorts. And that will help decompose the compost to make it real finished compost. So if that doesn't, does anyone else want to add anything else to that? No. Um, I'll add something. Um, so the, the specific ratio is really up for debate. I've looked it up and tried to figure out what the ratio is a few times. And it seems like everybody says something a little different, um, ranging all the way from like two to one in for two parts carbon, one part nitrogen, all the way up to like 30 parts carbon, one part nitrogen. So the main takeaway is that you need to have more carbon that you're putting in than the amount of food scraps you're putting in. Um, and that just, like Chrissy mentioned, it makes sure that the worms are able to keep doing their thing. Um, and I'll also post another link to a guide I used when I was setting up my own worm bin that um, has a lot of answers to some of these questions. So the reason why the carbon to nitrogen ratios varies a lot is because there are living creatures that are creating this little ecosystem and each location on earth is different and on composting can be done anywhere on earth. I mean, it's a natural process of food and renewal activity because nothing's created nor destroyed. So composting as a way to renewal your food waste. So it's, it's everywhere you go, just depending on, you know, how, how, how it is. <laughs> so our next question, India also asked, I make vegetable broth out of frozen food scraps by boiling them. Are the boiled scraps okay to compost too? Yeah, they're great to compost. They're still we support that. Any form of vegetables, we support. Uh, flowers work too, you know, plants, if you're like doing like clippings. Uh, weeds are a little, if you're de-weeding, I wouldn't really suggest putting those in the compost because then you'll have weeds in your compost. So that's just something you might keep in mind. Along with potatoes and onions, those things can, you can actually grow potatoes and onions in your compost. Along with seeds, you might want to save the seeds, like tomato seeds and whatnot. I know sometimes, like, I get lazy and throw the seeds <laughs> into the compost, and I've actually ended up having mysterious plants grow. So it's actually kind of a fun thing to do when I'm just, like, planting some soil and, like, I put some seeds in and it's like, oh, that's not the vegetable I wanted to grow. Um, <laughs> so it's just kind of interesting. Interesting if you want to have that little surprise, you know, like, what am I growing next? Like, I don't know, fun little. Uh, the reason I mentioned the freezing around. So scraps, um, I believe we answered. The reason I mentioned freezing your food scraps is if you're taking fresh food and you're thinking about composting it, it's kind of similar to chopping it up where it just makes it so that the worms can work on it faster. Chopping up increases the surface area that the worms are able to, um, worms or other microorganisms are able to start the decomposition process on. And when you freeze it, it just like expands and breaks the cell, individual cell walls, which makes it just one less barrier for the decomposition to start. But if you're freezing them, if they're frozen, food and then you're boiling it to make soup, then you should be good to go. It'll, um, it'll just be ready to go when you toss it in your compost. Then yeah, as far as the seeds, I know I eat a lot of bell peppers and I'll put the bell pepper seeds in my compost and there'll be little sprouts in there, but since there's not really any light getting in there, like they do have the oxygen to grow, but there's not really any light for them to photosynthesize. So 
they'll kind of just start sprouting and then die off and be another source of organic material. Yep, it all depends how you take care of your compost, really. Um, it's, I would say, a relatively simple process, but that's just because I've been doing it for a while and I grew up with composting. So if you didn't grow up with composting, there's definitely a big learning curve just due to the nature of different organisms that are involved in this process. But once you get over that hump of like, oh, kind of confused, uh, you can definitely you'll definitely just skyrocket and it becomes really easy. So if any any other questions, this is now the time to do so. Otherwise, we'll end the webinar. And if you do have any questions throughout the school year or just in general, just email, email us at rap at humble.edu. We'll answer your questions and yeah. Even if you're not a student anymore, you can still email us because I'm sure we'll still be around. Even after I graduate, I'm sure we'll still be around. We're a very long uh, organization that's been here on campus and I don't see it ending anytime soon. So um, I'm really excited for everyone. I'm really happy you all came. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, yeah, we're right on time. So I hope everyone has a lovely, lovely rest of your day and happy composting. And you're welcome for all the answers. Thank you for all of your questions, the excitement and the energy. Like, I know I can't see you face to face, but like the energy is what I'm here for. So yeah, thank you to all and I'll end the meeting. Have, yeah, woo, HSU <laughs> Compost Squad, woo, woo, woo. <laughs> I got one more question. Yeah. India asked oh, if you can get involved with rap. Um, this semester, there's not, mm, I'm not sure how many volunteer opportunities we'll have, but in a typical semester where we're able to have in-person activities, we would have lots of different events and um, movie nights that we'd be hosting. Um, but stay tuned, we'll probably be hosting more virtual activities later in the semester. and. Um, RAP is always looking for new interns and new employees, so feel free to apply for the spring semester if you're interested in getting involved. And currently there are little uh, movie meetings that are being held. RAP's hosting one of them as well as AS. So right now you can go on Canopy and watch those videos. Some of, their, some of them they are just like all over the place. I believe uh, the flyers are on our website. I'm not too sure, but basically it's on Canopy. Uh, yeah, if you email the RSA, um, they'll definitely send you the flyers, or if you email us, we'll send you the flyers just for the Zoom login information code. So if you're interested in watching a movie and then coming to the discussions on Wednesday, that would be a great place if you want to get involved with other organizations as well. Uh, just reach out to us. We'll send you all that information. And if you would rather just watch a movie with a bunch of other people on Zoom, those are being held on Thursday. And I believe it's just for the rest of this month. So that's something you may want to keep in mind. So, yeah. <laughs> if that's all of the questions, I will conclude the webinar as a success. Thank you everyone who came. Thank you for your wide-eyed learning eyes. And have a spooky October. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you from the Compost Squad. <laughs> <laughs>